In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter and Spirit of Truth, you are everywhere present and fill all things. Treasure your blessings, be star of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse of all stain and save our souls, O Holy One, for you are gracious always, now and forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I know it's late and it's been a very long day for everybody, but we wanted to have this special dramatic reading to invoke the intercession of the little flower, Saint Therese of Lisieux, in a special way. Saint Maximilian Kolbe said that naturalism is the wound of modern times. And many people do not realize that the little flower was a victim soul for those who would experience the temptation of naturalism. That is to explain the supernatural in terms of the natural. When she was dying, she said to her sisters that she went through the worst temptation of her life and the demonic forces impressed on her mind that science will be able to find an explanation for everything. In other words, she was being tempted to believe that everything that she had believed correctly was supernatural like the creation of all things, could be explained naturally. And she fought against that temptation until she took her last breath, especially for the popes, for the bishops, for the priests and the religious, but also even for us, for the lay people. And in this dramatic reading, we are going to see the contrast between people of great intelligence and sensitivity who do not have the light of supernatural faith and people who are not as gifted, perhaps, not as sensitive, but who have the light of supernatural faith and the supernatural hope and charity that go with it. And we'll see how these people lived through the same living hell on earth and yet had a totally different experience and how the little flower yep. played a special part in the lives of these particular soldiers who had that supernatural faith, hope, and charity. The little flower is the patron saint of Russia. And Our Lady of Fatima told us that if we didn't repent and turn back to God, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world. And we know that the principal error that took hold in Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution was evolutionism because only evolutionism made confident atheists, materialists, communists of Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky and the rest of the communist leaders. So we know also that Our Lady promised that Russia will be converted, which means the whole country is going to become a holy Christian nation and will become Catholic again. It is certain to happen. And so Russia, which led the world into the embrace of the lie of evolutionism and the modernism that is based on the lie of naturalism and evolutionism, will then become the leader back to the truth because Russia will become a great Catholic nation. 
And we need to recognize the little flower is our special patroness for the mission of the Kolbe Center and to hasten the conversion of Russia, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to usher in that year of peace and the social reign of Christ our King throughout the world. And so on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll let Brother Jonas uh, begin the program. Behold, I stand at the gate and knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that shall overcome, I will give to sit with me in my throne, as I also have overcome. And I will give to sit with me in my throne and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Has your soul sipped of the sweetness of all sweets. Has it well supped, but yet hungers and sweats? I have been witness of a strange sweetness, all fancy surpassing, past all supposing. Passing the rays of the rubies of the morning, or the soft rise of the moon, or the meaning known to the rose of her mystery and mourning. Sweeter than nocturnes of the wild nightingale, or than love's nectar after life's gall. Sweeter than odors of living leaves, sweeter than ardors of dying loves. Sweeter than death and dreams hereafter to one in dearth or life and its laughter or the proud wound the victor wears or the last end of all wars or the sweet murder after long guard unto the martyr smiling at God. To me was that smile, faint as a wang, worn myth, faint and exceeding small, on a boy's murdered mouth. Though from his throat the life tide leaps, there was no threat on his lips. But with the bitter blood and the death smell, all his life's sweetness bled into a smile. On the 27th of September, 1915, in the attack at Champagne, being a corporal stretch bearer, my role was to rescue the wounded and have them transported to the regimental station, 500 yards from the front line. For the duration of the 25th and the 26th, I worked nonstop without any food, and the only thing sustaining me was remembering the little sister. On the morning of the 27th, after a terrible night, as there had been an attack the previous evening, I went to the front line to see about rescuing the wounded. I came to a crest battered with bullets, and at that moment I felt my courage fail me. 
And then all of a sudden, the little sister took me by the hand and said to me very distinctly, Come along now, my friend. There are souls to save, and they are waiting for you. I looked up, and what did I see? The little sister. Thinking my mind was playing tricks on me, I crouched down on the ground and waited. But the call came again, more urgently. I stood up, and after having said a prayer to God, without daring to look at who was accompanying me, I went over the top at that moment. The enemy saw me, but no bullet was fired. I reached several wounded men who were waiting for me, the first of which had a special devotion to Sister Teresa of the Child Jesus. On the 25th of June, 1916, my sergeant having been killed the previous day, I went up to replace him under the Surgeon General in an extremely dangerous aid station. In the evening, after a tiring day, we were informed that several soldiers were in the front of the lines and that it was impossible to go and fetch them. When, at nightfall, I went with the Sergeant General to the place indicated where several seriously wounded soldiers, as soon as they were bandaged up, we had them transported behind the lines. Our task completed, we begun to retrace our steps back to the central aid station under a rain of iron and fire. Several of our stretch bearers were wounded. I took the lead, no longer knowing which way to go. There were krauts everywhere. I pressed my crucifix against my heart and prepared myself for th certain death. While around me, dead bodies were newly torn to shred by shells. Then at that moment, my relic of Sister Teresa joined my crucifix. I had an idea. What if I asked her to show me the way? Was I worthy to do so? Then I remembered what had happened on the 27th of September. Would she along by the hand? I looked to see who was leading me. There was nothing there. Pressing my crucifix and my relic against my heart, I whispered this prayer, Sister Teresa, protect us. After having run across the perilous zone, we reached the aid station, and it was then that I saw the little sister. She was uh, unpetaling a bright rose. Was it a dream? I don't know. But the dear saint was certainly there, and it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me. She had guided us. For several days, the perfume of newly blossomed roses lingered in the station. Who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? Wherefore rock they, purgatorial shadows? Drooping tongues from jays that slob their relish, bare barring teeth that leer like skulls, teeth wicked, stroke on stroke of pain. But what slow panic gouge these chasms round their fretted sockets, ever from their hair and through their hands, palms, misery swelters. Surely we have perished sleeping and walk hell, but who these hellish? These are men whose minds the dead have ravished, memory, fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed, waiting slows of flesh these helpless wander, treading blood from lungs that had loved laughter. Always they must see these things, and hear them. Batter of guns and shatter of flying muscles. Carnage incomparable and human squander. Rucked too thick for these men's extriction.
Therefore still, their eyeballs shrink tormented back into their brains because on their sense, sunlight seems a blood smear. Night comes blood black. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Thus, their heads wear this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness of set smiling corpses. Thus, their hands are plucking at each other, picking at the rope knouts of their scourging, snatching after us who smote them, brother, calling us who dealt them war and madness. It was 1917. I was in a military hospital with pneumonia. I was suffocating little by little, my body stiff and trembling. At moments, I couldn't breathe at all. But I didn't lose consciousness. I recall very well that a Red Cross nurse took my pulse, then, turning away from my bed, said to her buddies who were playing cards in the hall, he's dying. But all at once, I perceived in front of my bed a great light. At first, I thought it was feebleness that was giving me vision trouble. But when night had completely come, I saw the same light, and then little sister Teresa with a halo. I experienced a happiness I can never express. I don't hesitate to say that this night was the most painful of my life due to the great physical suffering I endured. Yet, at the same time, it was also the happiest time in my life. I soon found I could sit up in bed as if an invisible hand was helping me. By myself, I was absolutely incapable of making such an effort. Then I saw above my bed a great brightness, and when that disappeared, Sister Teresa showed herself to me. I saw her from 10 at night until 5 in the morning. She instructed me in the entire time. We conversed together. I had had doubts about the catechism. She said to me that this life is nothing, that there is a better one, and that anything that one has to endure on this earth is nothing compared to the happiness which we will be repaid. I was very chagrined how I had fallen away from God. She consoled me, assuring me that if I had repented and had confidence in God, the good God would forget everything and I could still be pleasing to him. She brought to my mind several saints who were sinners before they became holy. Everything she said was after was if the words were imprinted on the very depths of my heart. I felt the courage to suffer in this life as long as I could serve the good God and go to heaven with him. And this courage has not left me yet. I'm returning to the front Friday and I'll be in the front lines, but this doesn't bother me. If something does happen, I'll go to heaven. Sister Teresa promised me that. Red lips are not so red, and the stained stones kissed by the English dead. Kindness of wooed and wooer seems shame to their love pure. O oh love, your eyes lose lore, when I behold eyes blinded in my stead. Your slender attitude trembles not exquisite, like limbs knife skewed. Rolling and rolling there, where God seems not to care, till the fierce love they bear cramps them in death's extreme decrepitude. Your voice sings not so soft, though even as wind murmuring through the rafter loft, your dear voice is not dear, gentle and evening clear, as theirs whom none now hear. Now earth has stopped their piteous mouths that coughed. Heart, you were never hot, nor large, nor full like hearts made with great shot. And though your hand be pale, 
paler are all which trail your cross through flame and hail. Weep, you may weep, for you may touch them not. Yep. We're here in our re near, A in our toys. Part of my company is assigned to providing clean water to the lines where the active servicemen are sent. From two o'clock in the morning onwards and during the day of the 26th, 967 shells fell in the village sector. And on the 27th, up to 11 o'clock in the morning, 559 shells and they were all of a caliber. It was terrifying. The number of deaths and injuries sustained is as yet unknown. Now, I didn't place myself under Sister Teresa's protection just yesterday. And up until now, I can say that she has willed to keep her little soldier. Yesterday evening, during the bombing, I placed a picture of Sister Teresa for all to see in the blockhouse where the comrades in my squadron are camped, praying to her with all my heart to keep us safe and protect us. I am taking it upon myself to continue placing her picture in full view. And all the comrades have agreed to respect her, love her, and pray to her. How can I ever prove my gratitude to Sister Teresa? For I take pleasure in paying tribute to her miraculous intervention. Despite the bombings and various fatigue duties, not one man in my section has received a single scratch. In the blockhouse occupied by my squadron, in the trenches, Sister Teresa's picture holds pride of place in the center. Here, in the same way, we all respect your angelic little sister, and we have faith in her. Watch. How did I discover the story of a soul? I will admit to you that when I first read it, I found it very naive. I said to myself, Sister Teresa was privileged, lifted high by a holy family. She didn't know what real life was or sin. Her thoughts were always focused somewhere beyond the world. And then I considered things. I found that Sister Teresa's na naivety was quite simply perfect surrender and an immense act of love. I trust her. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty origins. No mockeries for them, no prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall. The flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. In spite of being the father of a family, I left my roofing business behind and went to the front in the first month of the war, August 1914. 
I carried a little relic of Sister Therese, and I evoked her at least 20 times a day. On September 17th, near Le Neville at Reims, about 4.30 in the afternoon, on a battlefield where enemy shells were falling as thick and fast as raindrops, I was hit six times. Several veins in my neck were cut, and I had a terrible gash in one foot. I collapsed and lost consciousness. I came to in the freshness of the evening, bathed in my own blood, which continued to flow from my open wounds. I felt weak to the point of death, but I cried out with ardent faith, my sister Therese, please help me. At once, I saw beside me my little saint. In one hand, she held a large crucifix, and in the other, she grasped my right arm and lifted me to my feet. Then she smiled at me and disappeared. I had noticed the blood had stopped flowing from my wounds, as if a heavenly hand had bandaged them. I no longer felt the least suffering, so I ran to the first aid post, which was 400 meters from the battlefield. Although I had to have one more operation on my foot, I never suffered after seeing Tr Therese. I returned to the front with only one fear, that of being taken prisoner. So I asked Therese for the for death over captivity. Then I rethought my request and asked her that if I had to be taken captive, I would be severely wounded so that I would have a good chance of being repatriated. On June 1st, 1916, some of my comrades and I found ourselves surrounded by Germans. The German officer urged us to throw down our arms, but something inside me told me to keep on going. So several of my buddies and I went on fighting. After no more than a minute, two of us were dead and I had taken a bullet in my right shoulder. But I threw two more grenades with my left hand. Then I was hit again in the right side and on the left shoulder. I fell on my back, unable to move. Soon my last comrade went down while our captain, refusing to surrender, was killed at point blank range. A German officer aimed at my cheek to finish me off, but an officer stopped his arm. I stayed there for three days, stretched out, unable to move. It was clear that my holy protectress did not abandon me. I lay in a narrow trench through which the enemies were advancing. Past me marched hundreds of German soldiers in solid ranks, but not one single of them walked on me. All of them, on the contrary, at the risk of being killed, stepped on the edge of the sloping trench wall so as not to touch me. However, I was at the end of my strength and suffering so much that on the third day, I asked Sister Therese to free me from my pains and by letting me die. At that very instant, without being able to explain how, because by myself, I couldn't move at all, I find myself suddenly upright in the trench, able to walk. I set out to seek help and ran into some Germans, one of whom gave me some coffee to drink instead of giving it to a wounded German who wasn't very happy about that. But the officer who was giving me the drink told him that I was ba more badly wounded than he was, so he only got water. Then they sent me to an aid station. Since the bombardment by artillery continued without let up, as we tried to regain the ground we had lost. When I got to the post, a German military chaplain there had had me get down without a warning that, with a warning that deeply touched me into a nearby shell crater. Eventually, they took me to the rear to a hospital because I was severely wounded and they operated on me at once. After that, they transported me to a hospital in Sutgar where I found some good nuns who took care of me very well. I stayed in Germany until December 15th when I was repatriated via Switzerland as a severely wounded prisoner of war. Although I was almost completely recovered, it was, that I, it was there that I met a soldier named Lattice who was very sick with tuberculosis. I taught him to pray to Sister Teresa and he was suddenly and completely cured. I met another soldier for whom I had prayed that he would either be cured or die in peace with God and happy. The lovely fragrance that surrounded him after he died told me that my prayer was answered.
Behold, I stand at the gate and knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that shall overcome, I will give to sit with me in my throne, as I also have overcome, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Brother Walton, this you give us your blessing, and then you go to our places. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ, in his everlasting kindness, mercy, and love for mankind, grant you many happy years, peace, health, and salvation, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.